classics of sociology are, are published during this time. He's there until 1968. After that, he ends up uh, teaching at the Collège de France. He does one of his great works uh, in the mid 70s. Uh, some call it his magnum opus, Clausewitz, uh, Pensée la Guerre. Um, and then he actually also founds a, a review, which still exists today. It's called Commentaire, and I have one of the, the latest edition sitting on the table uh, over there. So it's one of the voices of uh, French liberalism uh, that's still around right now. Um, so yes, and then dies in 1983. So essentially, I'm, I'm dealing with a person whose public engagement was very much constituted by, I mean, it was the life of the mind, the life of ideas. And as such, this is a work of intellectual history, intellectual biography. My idea for the book was quite modest, I have to say. Um, I wanted essentially just to try and take Aron at his word. He says in one of his works, in Main Currents in Sociological Thought, when he's talking about Marx, he says, if you are uncertain of your own genius, and you probably should be, then it's best to start with how an author understood himself, you know, as opposed to imposing some inter interpretation on him. Start with what he said about himself, and that's essentially all I do with Aron. And one of the things I notice is that he keeps referring to certain German thinkers, uh, certain key aspects in, in German philosophy, in, uh, in discussing his own uh, philosophy. And what I noticed in a lot of the literature is there's a tendency to talk about, let's say, how he fits into the French liberal tradition, you know, Montesquieu, Tocqueville, all those guys. Some other people like to talk about this Aristotelian side of our own. Uh, they focus on what he has to say about prudence or they focus on what he has to say about political regime, which sounds very Aristotelian. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with the literature on this, but I wanted to actually look at our own through this prism um, of German thought, which is how I think he actually looked at himself uh, as well. And I think that there's an underlying coherence to his thought uh, over his whole life, which is based in problems raised by certain German thinkers. They are none less than examining the specific features of consciousness of man by man, or of human history by an historically situated subject, the relation between knowledge and action, and, in the end, between philosophy and politics. So we'll get into a little bit of that uh, today. So essentially what I've done in my book is I've divided it into three sort of sections uh, that deal with three main parts of our own thought. History, sociology, Praxeology. And I have essentially assigned a, um, a thinker, a German thinker, to each one of these sections with whom I think Aron is in dialogue. So in the case of history, it's Wilhelm Dilthey. In the case of sociology, it's Karl Marx. And in the case of praxeology, uh, it's Max Weber. Uh, and what he understands by praxeology, I'm not exactly sure how, how Mises uses Term. This is going to be part of my education here at the Austrian Economic Center. Uh, what our own means by it is sort of the relation between uh, morality and ethics and, and political action and power and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so what we'll do is we're going to go through each of these three sections and uh, hopefully it'll be interesting and appealing. And I will have considered my work here successful if it inspires even just one of you to read something by our own. Not even my book, read our own. He was more intelligent and wrote with greater clarity than I do. And uh, frankly, he was a voice of moderation sobriety, which was sorely lacking in Paris of his day, and well, sorely lacking probably in the Paris of today, and, and in the world at large. Uh, so read our world is, I suppose, the main thesis statement of my talk. OK, so history. <coughs> How do we look at history? You know, I mean, you had some people, if you'd asked a guy like Machiavelli or Polybius or uh, Plato, they would have seen it as cycles, cycles of regimes, you know, so you've got a, a monarchy, but then, you know, the monarchy becomes corrupt and, you know, self-centered and everything, and it degenerates into a tyranny. You get a coterie of the best men, the aristocrats, who overthrow him, and then you have an aristocracy, but they too become corrupt, as tends to happen, and it turns into an oligarchy. And then you have the people rise up, it becomes a democracy, or what, what they call the politeia, but then that becomes corrupt as well and turns into some sort of anarchy or, or mob rule, and then we, you know, we come back to a monarchy, basically. So, I mean, if we look at our history you know, right now and everything that we're writing about democracy, we're probably somewhere, I don't know if we're still in the good form of democracy and the bad form of democracy, but it would seem like whether in our lifetimes or not, according to this ancient view of cycles, we might, be a, we might have monarchy coming up, actually.
actually, at some point. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was one way you could look at it. Another way you could look at history would be like decline, for example. And this is an old narrative. We're, we're constantly in decline. I mean, well, just last year, Jonah Goldberg, you know, writes for National Review. He, he published a book, Suicide of the West. He's looking at how tribalism, identity politics, uh, nationalism, and populism are destroying American democracy. Fifty years before that, you had uh, James Byrne also published a book called uh, Suicide of the West. But he's kind of looking at how liberalism is responsible for um, for the West's demise, and not just you know left-wing liberalism, but uh, classical liberalism. It would seem. Fifty years before that, you have Oswald Spengler also talking about decline of the West. I mean, it, it's a long narrative. Go back to like Hesiod, you know, uh, the idea that you know we had a golden age, and then there's a silver age, a bronze age, heroic age, and now there's us. Very very imperfect. Um, so yeah, history is just constant decline. Um, or <coughs> you could look at history as actually just a narrative of progress, a steady sort of upward movement, you know, that through science and technology and advancement, material advancement, prosperity, everything like that, our moral sentiments are being softened, we're becoming better people and everything. And if you believe that, um, you would have found yourself in, in, in all right company, actually, with uh, some of our own teachers in France at the time, who did believe in precisely this. Uh, they didn't see any sort of difference in, in, in actually their most extreme form. They did not see any difference between the laws that govern the natural world and the laws that govern the human world, and everything was just sort of on the up and up. I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying as I go through all of this because I'm going to run through a whole bunch of ideas, so, um, so forgive me for that. So this is essentially what's going on in France, um, one of the main ways of looking at the world. And that's what Aron was raised with. He goes over to Germany in the 1930s. What do the Germans think about history? Well, it's a little bit different, and it's a very complicated story. Uh, so if I'm going to boil it down, I would say you're dealing with a post-Kantian tradition where they have a clear separation between the natural world on the one hand, and the human world on the other. And part of the reason this distinction was important was because, you know, the natural world's governed by laws of development, but the human world has free will, so there's a, an element of unpredictability there. So it's sort of your difference between, you know, positivism on the one hand and idealism on the other. Now that put um, German historical thought in a weird sort of position. Uh, one of the reasons for that is you, you see the development here of something called historicism, which also has a lot of meanings. But one of them is that any sort of historical time period that you look at is totally unique in and of itself. Every sort of configuration. It's kind of like you know Heraclitus, where he says that you know you can't step into the same river twice. Everything's constantly in flux, but everything is totally, every configuration, what we got right now, is totally unique, you know? Um, so you had some historians who essentially were looking at history as a laundry list of just every kind of unique sort of event or whatever. But actually connecting them uh, was something that they weren't very successful at. You had other people who decided to go to the exact opposite end and say, you know what, let's try and find one sort of principle by which we can explain all of history. And that's uh, what uh, a guy like uh, Hegel does, for example. You have his whole Weltgeist and everything like that. Uh, Marx does it too. Um, but with Marx, it's, it's a bit different, because Marx chooses to jettison the metaphysical foundation that Hegel is using, and he wants to base it on materialism, not idealism, on science and not metaphysics. Now the guy I chose for this section was Wilhelm Diltai. Why? Because Diltai is dealing with um, a bit of a different problem. Diltai's problem is, okay, he wants to understand the whole course of history. How can I account for all of history? But at the same time, though, he's also said, how can I understand it when I'm in it? You know, when I'm kind of a part of the very object that I want to study. Now, this sounds really abstract and, uh, and silly, but um, to put it in really concrete terms, what Diltai wanted to figure out was, 
or what Diltai believed is that you had a sort of dialectical or reciprocal relationship between you as you know uh, someone examining an object of research and you know being a part of that object of research and how it affects you. So let's put it into terms uh, like you get a let's say you have a married couple. If you're to ask a married couple how they look at their lives, you know, or how they look at the history of their marriage, how long they've been married, they'd look back and they'd point to probably when they got married and they'd point to some of the, the great points of their, the great moments of their marriage. That's how they'd see their history. Now, let's say they get divorced now, and let's say it's a particularly acrimonious divorce. You ask them now to look back at their marriage, you're going to point out, they're going to point out rather, all of the uh, really terrible things that happened in their relationship. All of the many steps that somehow inevitably led up to that divorce, you know? Where before they were fo focusing on the, the happy moments, now they're going to be saying, ah, you know what, I knew, I knew that I should have seen that at the time. I should have seen this was destined for failure, you know? The signs were all there, but I was too stupid to pay attention to them at the time. You rewrite your entire history on the basis of your present. And of course, as you look at that history and you reflect on all of those bad moments, you reflect differently on your present and also on what you're going to be doing moving forward. Because you're going to say, you know, this is why everything's so bad, everything's so awful. Look at how many terrible moments there are. This is why this divorce had to happen. And I am never making that mistake again moving forward in my life. I'm not going to end up with someone like that again. You rewrote the entire thing. You know, on the basis, and so there's a, on the basis of what is going on in the present, on the basis of changed events. So the point is that there is this constant sort of interaction between how you view your present and how you view your past, and how you view your future, where you're going, in light of all of that. It's, it's constantly in, in, in flux. Um, so this was essentially uh, Diltai's issue, and one of the problems that he runs into, though, is he, he thinks that you need to be able to, uh, you can't really say anything truthful unless you have sort of seen all of history. But that means then that history needs to come to an end. Now, Diltai was not blessed with the friendship of Francis Fukuyama, so I'm not sure what he, what he would have said to him. But, uh, on the other side of the coin though, if history's not at an end, because it's not, then that would mean that we haven't found the truth. You can't actually say really anything true about history. Moreover, is history even possible without truth or progress? So Diltai gets caught up in this issue, which he never really fully resolves, and he ends up passing away in 1911. Um, our own solution is partly, in some respects, elegant, uh, but partly also, on Diltai's terms, a bit of a cop-out. Our own basically says, look, we can't account for all of history, you know? It's not going to be a singular interpretation for all of human history. Instead, you're going to have a plurality of interpretations. Um, and this isn't a sort of like cop out or some sort of cheap concession of relativism. It, it, it makes sense. I mean, you, if you take, for example, um, look at a guy like Thucydides, our own loved site in Thucydides, for all sorts of reasons. Because Thucydides is incredibly rich. In fact, in addition to reading our own, read Thucydides as well. That, those are the two things to read. And then read my book afterwards. Thucydides, how's Thucydides interpreted throughout history? If you go back to the 17th century, the first direct English translation, and still one of the greatest in the English language, of Thucydides from ancient Greek and English, is by Thomas Hobbes, 1627 or 1629, something like that. Now, Hobbes writes a long preface to it, and he says, well, Thucydides' narrative is basically showing just how awful a uh, democracy is. And, you know, Hobbes had all sorts of reasons for saying that. Skip forward. In the First World War, people were looking at Thucydides because he, his outbreak of the Peloponnesian War looked to some people very similar to the outbreak of the First World War. You know, a small kind of event, but because of an alliance structure or something like that, uh, it all ends up going to hell. You know, I mean, the, the Peloponnesian War starts with, basically, you've got Corsaira, which is the son or daughter city of Corinth, Corinth is there with Sparta, and all of a sudden, uh, Corsaira asks Athens for help, you know, because they've got some small little dispute going on between the two of them, and then Athens and Sparta jump in, and what looks like, you know, war that should have been over by Christmas ends up taking a lot longer. In the Second World War, people saw something else in Thucydides. 
the sort of bipolar world. Athens versus Sparta, maritime empire, uh, United States versus USSR, land power, democracy versus you know, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, whatever. Um, and it's, these aren't you know, being read necessarily into Thucydides. This all exists in Thucydides. That's why he's so rich. You know? uh, they're all valid interpretations. So this is one of the things that Alan says, a plurality of interpretations. Another thing that he talks about, though, is one of the, I mentioned earlier, one of the conceits of historicism was this idea that every kind of historical time period is totally unique to itself. Now forget about how we address the complicated question of how you, you know, how do you, how do you parcel out a time period? You know, where, when does one begin, when does one end? But every single moment is entirely unique in and of itself. And also that the logic of a particular time period, to the extent that even the reason of a particular time period was unique to that time period, that it remained incommunicable to other time periods. And our own says that, no, basically reason, it can be empirically observed that reason exists through time, actually. You know, we wouldn't be able to read Thucydides and profit from what he has to say there if there weren't some similarities in his way of thinking and in his world compared to ours. So reason exists through time. So one of the things that our own wants to figure out then is what is it that makes our time so interesting? Or what is it that makes our time unique? In what respects is our society the same as all the ones that uh, preceded ours? In what respects is it totally different? And this is where we come to the need to study society, and the second part of the, uh, of the book, which is uh, called Sociology. So, I asked what's totally unique about our time period, and what is consistent with all other societies? Now, Rome's going to study this question on many different levels. This is one of the reasons I think he's also involved in journalism. Because in journalism, every, every day, you know, he's trying to comprehend history in the making, trying to comprehend what is the same, what is changing over time. But he also studies this question in uh, some of his, his lectures at the Sorbonne, in fact, his very first lectures there, which deal with uh, what he calls industrial society. So essentially what he's trying to study here is no less than what uh, has been called by some other people uh, modernity. And many different people have different views as to what constitutes modernity. If you'd asked about like Karl Marx, he would have said, well, our time period is characterized by the class struggle. And not just any class struggle, specifically the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, if you'd asked someone like Tocqueville, Tocqueville would have said, our time is characterized by this steady sort of movement towards democracy and egalitarianism. And not, not just democracy as a system of government, but also de democracy as an ethic, you know, where equality becomes our very highest goal. And the question for, for Tocqueville then is, is our egalitarian society going to be a free one, or is it going to be a tyrannical one? If you'd asked a guy like Max Weber, Weber would have said that our society is characterized by increasing rationalization, the whole disenchantment of the world. There are no longer questions that mystify us. Mysticism is entirely gone. At this point, we can answer everything, all of the mysteries, or if we don't know the answer yet, we will know it at some point. Now, what these three individuals share in common, again, to overgeneralize here, is that they all thought that these movements whether it be to egalitarianism, rationalization, class struggle, and revolution, everything, were inevitable. Our own doesn't necessarily go so far there. He wants to look at industrial society, which he says you could have also called technological society, scientific society, rational society, whatever. And I think here he has Karl Marx as his interlocutor. I think that's clear from, uh, from some of the examples he brings up over the course of his study. Um, and I, I think, it was, as I'll make clear here, um, what does Karl Marx have to say? So, put very simply, you have, due to this conflict happening on the infrastructural level, 
related to the conflict between the people who have the uh, means, own the means of production and those who do not. You have an ever-growing kind of industrial reserve army and an ever-declining, diminishing, but increasingly powerful group of capitalists. At some point, it hits a critical mass. You get a revolution, and then the proletariat comes out on top. You don't need the state. You don't need anything after that point. We all, I think, at that point are supposed to be happy. Uh, we all work in the factory in the morning. We go fishing in the afternoon, and we read Plato in the evening. I forget which text it is when Marx says that, but it's, 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 it's interesting, you know. Um, it's actually interesting also because it's a really aristocratic way of looking at things. You know, I mean, we read Plato in the evening. Who does that? Sorry? Yeah, that's right. I, I don't go to the factory, I don't fish, though. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so. So this is Marx's uh, general idea. Well, how do you define a class then? Marx has many different uh, sections where he talks about class. I mean, in the Communist Manifesto, famously, he speaks of essentially just the two, bourgeoisie and proletariat. But in other places, though, whether it be the 18th Brumaire or Revolution, Counter-Revolution in Germany, I think class struggles in France, he's got about eight, seven or eight different uh, ways of characterizing class. Um, so I'm not sure really how, how carefully Marx had, had delineated between uh, different kinds of classes. And one of the interesting points I should mention just as an aside about Marx is in one of those texts, he, he has a very dismissive view of the peasantry, and he says they can never constitute a class, you know? Um, part of the reason is because they don't engage enough in sort of relations with other beings to make them constitute a class, but also because they don't have a class consciousness, you know? Um, which, which makes one wonder, you know, should we sort of give the people a class consciousness, you know? Give history a little helping hand. That was, I think that was sort of the, the lesson that, that Lenin took from, from Marx. Um, in any case, so the definition of class is somewhat unclear. Infrastructure versus superstructure. So all of our great ideas, politics, legal systems, everything like that, is basically the result of what is going on at the infrastructural level, this, this conflict uh, between people relating to the, uh, the forces production. Um, history. What is history? Well, the history of all time periods is really the history of the class struggle, as he states very clearly in the Communist Manifesto. So what we got here, and he seems to be quite certain that this is, this is the only way of looking at history, and that it is inevitable that we will move in the direction that he has laid out. So you have, between our own and Marx, you have law, laws of history versus just causes, one of many. Singular interpretation versus plurality of interpretations. You have, one could say maybe, the hedgehog versus the fox, as it were. Right, you know, you know the, uh, was it Isaiah Berlin speaks of the fox and the hedgehog in the 1950s. Um, he writes this essay, actually it's on Tolstoy. He wants to talk about how Tolstoy's view of history is so, uh, so unique because he combines the fox and the hedgehog approach. He takes it from an old poem from Archilochus, a little fragment where the Greek uh, poet Archilochus talks about how the fox knows many tricks, but the hedgehog only knows one. One big trick, you know? And, and the, the way I guess that Tolstoy uses this, or sorry, that um, Berlin uses this, is to say that the fox you know, has a, you know, a plurality of interpretations or ways of explaining things, whereas the hedgehog really only has one. Everything comes down to a singular sort of factor. And this, this scheme has been used actually on a few different occasions. Back in 2002, I think, Philip uh, Tetlock, uh, who was a psychologist, he wrote a book called, um, I forget what exactly it's called, but he was looking at why, uh, about predictive power in, you know, amongst pundits and people like that. And he found that if um, he wasn't able to figure out, you know, which, any sort of factors as to, to determine why pundits, some pundits were often right and others were often wrong. The one that he did find out was asking them whether they associate, they think of their way of thinking more as a fox or a hedgehog. And the foxes were always better predicting. Part of the reason is because the foxes could see just so many different causes for something. So, it's, and it's used actually recently as well uh, in John Lewis Gaddis' uh, latest work, uh, whose title also eludes me. Um, he also starts off by talking about the fox and, and the hedgehog, uh, essentially. 
um, talking about Xerxes and uh, his his advisor. Um, they're they're about to cross the 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 water, and uh, you know Xerxes is a hedgehog. He's so single-minded. He's got his goal in mind, and that's he's gonna go for it, you know, at any cost. And uh, his his advisor is telling him about all the things, the terrible things that could happen, all the things they got they got to watch out for. You kind of need maybe you kind of need both of them. Anyhow, um, so our one versus Mar Marx, maybe Fox versus Hedgehog is one way of thinking about it. Okay, so what does our one actually have to say about industrial society? Well, we've got three different dimensions in our own skin. You've got an economic dimension, you've got a social dimension, and you've got a political dimension. One of the things that our one notices about industrial society is that it is common to both the East and the West. Um, this will become clearer. I think as we go on here. Uh, he also notes that Marx is correct to focus on the economy. Marx zeroes in on the economy in, in a way that, uh, that Tocqueville, for example, uh, does not. And, and this, is, this is important in our own things in understanding industrial society. So what are some of the components of industrial society? What's, what's the nature of industrial society? Well, our own says it's characterized by several things. It'd be interesting to compare, actually, with us today to see if our, to what extent our own theory still holds up today, or if we can speak of ourselves as being in a different kind of society now. He says, well, you got a separation of the workplace and the family. You have a division of labor, even within an enterprise. So you got your IT department, you got your you know, legal department, you got your whatever. Um, you have an accumulation of capital for investment and expansion. You have economic calculation with a view to increasing capital, uh, and you have a concentration of workers in the workplace. And he mentions some other components uh, in, in terms of the social aspect of industrial society. He says, you have urbanization, people moving to the cities. You've got what he called salarization, so he meant essentially growing number of wage earners, a decreasing number of independent earners. You have differentiation, uh, more jobs with specialized skill set. And you have what he calls en bourgeoisement, becoming more bourgeois, increasing standard of living for the majority of the population. Now, I mean, it's interesting in, in our context today, especially when I read some of these first ones, like separation of workplace and family. Really? Wake up every morning, go to bed every night, you check your emails, you write your 200th email, 200th incomprehensible email for the day, you know? I mean, where everything's moving at such a fast pace and whatnot. Are, is our workplace and our family really separated? I can tell you mine isn't. You know, I don't know about yours. But um, division of labor, even within an enterprise. I can't tell you how many friends I've spoken to, some of them are even sitting here right now, whose job descriptions do not in the slightest reflect what it is that they're doing in an enterprise. You know? I mean, it's it's... It's crazy, you kind of expect it to sort of be a renaissance man. You do a little bit of everything. You're working in every sort of department. Um, and yeah, so a concentration of workers in the workplace, uh, to some ex extent, I think, in many places in the world, that's certainly the case. Um, but you know, increasingly, I've got friends who are interested in remote working. You know, they want to just be mobile their whole lives. They don't really have homes. They just kind of go around the world with their laptop. They do everything online, basically. Um, so there's a weird sense in which, you know, insofar, if, if we can't characterize the industrial society and economic dimension was this separation of workplace and family and everything that goes with it, and if we're seeing that, and if pre-industrial was where those two things were together, I kind of wonder at times if we're, are we kind of reverting in a weird sense to a pre-industrial sort of a society in certain respects? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know, something to, to reflect on. Um, and if that's the case, I hope we don't revert to pre-industrial growth rates. Um, so much of our modeling, our expectations for the future, are based on growth rates that I don't know if we'll, we'll, we'll see again, maybe we will. Um, but it would seem to me that a lot of our economic theorizing is based on a time period that was very unique in human history, what the French called les trente glorieuses, from you know, the end of the Second World War to like the 1970s. Um, I mentioned the whole idea of returning pre-industrial growth rates because Aron says that the motor, what drives industrial society in its economic dimension, is growth. And he says, what are some of the factors that feed into growth? Well, he says, a spirit of science and technology, 
a spirit of economic calculation, a spirit of progress, change, and innovation, and that there are certain conditions that encourage the development of the spirit. For example, um, an institutional framework. You gotta have a legal system. You know, certain laws need to be upheld in order to ensure that the market works. Um, you need to have a rational and predictable administration. You need to have incentives. And you need to have capital and population. So these are some of the aspects that Arwen talks about in the economic dimension of industrial society. When we go to the social dimension, we're focusing here now on Marx and class struggle. So what's a class? What's a class in Arwen's view? I think in Arwen's view, a class has three different components. A class is kind of partially subjective. It kind of does depend on sort of what you feel, but it's also partially objective too. There are certain indicators you can look at. So the more objective things I want points to is well, you can look at you know what someone's employment is, what their work is, what their income level is, you know, property, things like that. But there are also more subjective components. Does the class, for example, have a certain unity? Does the putative class have a unified view? Of, of the world, of their unified ideals, morals, values. Do they even have class consciousness? Do they actually feel that they constitute a class specifically of the type that would pit them against another class and potentially lead to a struggle between the two of them? I think the subjective bit is, is, is important. Uh, in our world's time, uh, you know, you compare the U.S. and France, and I think the same, it's the same thing probably still today with the U.S. A lot of people, you ask the majority of Americans uh, what class they belong to, and they all kind of think they're middle class, even though their income is like, there's a huge disparity between their, their income levels. Uh, maybe that's, I don't know why, maybe it's because Americans want to feel that um, they, they, you know, they exist in a sort of realm of mobility, and that everything that they've earned, they've earned by the sweat of their own brow. Uh, they're not aristocrats, they're not in the upper class, you know, and they're also not lower class. In the, uh, the French case, I don't know what it is in France today, but Aron was saying that uh, the French at this time, that typically the majority, they, they like to think of themselves as working class. Actually, they're the proletariat, regardless of their income level. Um, and maybe one of the reasons for that is because, you know, they, if you have a lot of Marxism in the air, you know, a lot of people believe in that, the proletariats, they're the way with history. Don't you want to be on them? on the side of history, you know, ride that wave. So, I, I don't know, I think this is one of the reasons why um, class is something that's, that's uh, subjective. And I think it's, it's an interesting thing to reflect on in our context today, because we talk a lot about groups today, you know, especially in North America. I mean, groups based on race, on gender, on whatever. And I wonder if some groups are, are more real than, than others. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Marx, in any case, is onto something when he's discussing class. But I won't think that there's something else that <clears throat> Marx or that one should look at, not just bourgeoisie and proletariat, but rather he points to the difference between uh, two different classes, the ruling elite and the masses, or the people. So the ruling elite are those who hold power. And he thinks this is important because he thinks that you see this actually in all sorts of societies, this division between the ruling elite, the governors, and the governed, as Aristotle may have put it. So who are those people who, who hold power? Well, Rome starts with a, a few different uh, categories. He speaks of different kinds of power. You've got spiritual power. What he means by that is um, people like priests, intellectuals, scientists. These are the people who, whose job, they, they wield their power by convincing other people. You've got political power. So political leaders, administrators, heads of the army, police. These people wield their power by constraining. You've got uh, economic power. So those who provide well-being and growth. Uh, these are uh, the owners of the means of production, managers, etc. And then finally, you've got the leaders of the people, leaders of the masses. These are the guys who rally the people up. Now, one of the things that Arwan says about the elite in, in the West, compared to previous times and compared to the USSR, in contrast to the USSR in previous times, is that the elite is divided uh, today. And now what that, one of the things that means is that power is increasingly diffused. 
which can also mean it's increasingly difficult to apportion blame or responsibility to everything. I mean, who is responsible for all the good and bad things that happen in, in the world uh, today? And so I would be surprised if that leads to a greater proliferation of, of conspiracy uh, theories. Now, the key point here is that the analysis of power and these different classes um, leads to an analysis of political regimes. And here, one of the reasons why I think that our own looking at the social element is so important is because he connects the historically unique dimension of industrial society, namely our focus on growth, the economy, everything like that, with also the perennial questions of political philosophy which is to say the question of the regime, the best regime. And we come to the third part of his sociological analysis, which is his analysis of regime. We talk a lot about democracy nowadays, um, sometimes to, to lambaste it for you know, not producing the sorts of outcomes that we would want it to produce. Our own actually uh, preferred to use the rather infelicitous term of constitutional pluralism, uh, but because he felt that that more accurately described what, what people were referring to when they talked about democracy. And so by that he means, you know, essentially the society that we live in right now. A legally organized, uh, they're legally organized, there's a peaceful competition for power, where the party in power acts in conformity with the Constitution and the laws. Um, it is driven by a respect for law and a sense of compromise. It has certain ideals as well. Popular sovereignty, equality, liberty. Now the problem with these ideals is that they can also be interpreted very differently. I mean, we know Hayek's famous distinction between equality for the law and uh, equality of outcome, for example. Similarly, liberty can be interpreted in many different ways. He doesn't really take a side on which interpretation is correct or anything. He just says this is his analysis of sociological. He's saying this is what people are essentially saying. You know, in terms of their definitions of liberty. And there are weaknesses as well with this kind of regime. Um, and, you know, the literature today is certainly, uh, you know, exposes a lot of them uh, too. Some of the weaknesses that, um, that our one points out is, uh, for one, that they can have an excess, if you have an excess uh, oligarchy or demagogy, it can be bad for the regime. Uh, you can have, or sorry, some dangers, or as if you have excess oligarchy and demagogy. Uh, excessive concessions to private interests. Uh, the perpetual temptation to opt for comfort, for example, by sacrificing military preparedness. Uh, inability to choose a coherent policy. One of the great virtues and the great downsides of a constitutional pluralist regime is that its, its virtues are negative. They, they permit liberties. They underscore the imperfections of human nature. They limit authority, but their solutions are always imperfect. Uh, and such a regime uh, will therefore always be unsatisfying to those who dislike compromise or to those who are impatient with the regime's ideals and the imperfections of reality and would therefore rather call heaven down on earth in this very instant. So we arrive at the final theme of the political regime, which is what our own calls the primacy of the political. What does he mean by this? Well, the political is that sphere where different policies and visions and philosophies of communal life conflict. We said earlier that growth, for example, in, in, in the economic sphere was one of the priorities of industrial society. Well, growth isn't necessarily an objective in and of itself. Growth, the need for growth, needs to be balanced out against other things other values that exist in this regime, partly due to its political form, for example, liberty or equality. Or, in the case of a tyranny, uh, something like growth would need to be balanced out against fear. Fear is the motor of a tyranny, at least in Montesquieu's understanding of it. So, the economic sphere, the social sphere, and the political sphere all kind of interact. Some influences will be uh, probably stronger than others, or statesmen will take certain influences more into account than others, things like, you know, the need for growth, for employment, and stuff like that. But there's also room left for, for free will. There's an interplay in society and in history between process and drama. 
What that means is that there are certain currents in history that make certain societies and forms of behavior probable, but there's always a little bit of room left for free will. Um, to give another example, a, a, an historian, I was watching a video a little while back, an historian says, you know, if you had an alien drop in and take a snapshot of like human society, just like every hundred years, just to see how we're doing. You know, if you stopped off 1700, 1800, 1900, 2000, it's not looking bad. I mean, we got a lot of advancements in the time, a lot more people, everything like that. You would have missed some of the important dates in those three centuries. And that's sort of exactly our one's point. You have process, you know, the sort of steady, maybe upward kind of uh, movement over the three centuries, but you've also got drama that happens in the meantime. Wars, for example that break out, uh, break moments of violence. And one of the things that that means is that individuals, because individuals are largely responsible for a lot of drama, individuals and accidents make a difference. What does the Second World War look like without Churchill? Or without Hitler, for that matter? And that's where you come to the final part of the book, which is praxeology. Individuals make a difference. What should the individual do? What should the statesman do? That's sort of the person that our own focuses on. Our own relates back in 1932. He was, you know, coming back from Germany for a brief period of time and uh, to France. And uh, he, his older brother, was hobnobbing with a lot of politicians. And so our own had the opportunity to meet uh, certain Joseph Paganon, who was uh, Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs. And our own was doing like um, much like I'm doing uh, here today. He was speaking at great length about philosophical issues. Uh, without really knowing how to connect them to reality and that sort of thing. And uh, the statesman put to him a very simple question, uh, which if you, you, you needn't put it to me today because I won't know how to answer it, simply like I did not as well. Uh, I said, fine, you know what? Actually, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs is a man of great initiative. He loves hearing new ideas and proposals. He likes hearing what the youth have to say. Tell me, if you were in his position, what would you do? And our own apparently was, he had, he had nothing, you know, I mean, uh, at that point. Um, but from that moment on, our own thought to himself that he was always going to try and put himself in the perspective of the statesman and figure out, given those constraints, given the imperfect information, the fog of war, what, you, what is actually possible? What can you actually do? Um, now, I'm not going to talk a lot, I'm not going to talk at all actually about what he says in specific instances because my book doesn't really deal with that. I, I deal with more of the philosophical uh, level. And I won't have a tendency uh, to speak about uh, certain principles of political action. He refers, for example, in the text that I have over there on the table, Peace and War. He creates a, a, this sort of dichotomy, a simple, a very simplified one, between Machiavelli and Kant. So Machiavelli for him represents a certain sort of cynical view, a power politics based view of, uh, of, of, of human nature. Uh, and one also where the only sort of moral standard you need to care about are the consequences of, of your actions. You know? So the actual intentions going into it, your convictions are irrelevant. What is of greatest import are the consequences. Um, I should mention as an aside that Machiavelli nowhere actually says and is justified the means. He has only two sections in one of the prints and one of the discourses where he says that if you are sort of blamed or accused for a certain act, if the consequences were good, then you are excused for having done that, which is a very different thing because it doesn't make it a morally sort of operative principle. It's not a general principle. It's an ex post facto sort of uh, clarification for, for that act. Kant is the other guy on the other opposite. He's, he's got this deontological ethics, and basically for him, the consequences don't matter. What matters um, is, is the, uh, that you act according to specific rules, regardless of the consequences. Um, Marx, as well as, as some of that Arwen uses at times, Marx has, um, is what Arwen calls the polit politician of, of reason, with a capital R, a singular sort of reason. He believes that he's seen the future, and your job as, uh, as someone in a position of power is simply to do what you can to kind of make it, make it happen, because it's, it's obviously it's the only way that things can go. But the person I choose to uh, confront our own with here is uh, Max Weber, uh, for all sorts of reasons. One of them is that um, our own had felt that he had uh, with, shared with Weber 
uh, a Wahlverwandtschaft, as he terms it, uh, an elective affinity. Uh, they both believed, they took individuals and intentions as their starting point. They allowed, they both believed in, you know, some level of free, free will. Um, they had a partial view of history. They both believed that in a plurality of interpretations and that you can par understand partial causes throughout history. This is important because what was once our past, or what, what is our past, was once the uncertain future for others. Um, so what does Weber have to say about action? Well, Weber lays it out most clearly in his lecture, uh, 1919, Politik als Beruf. Two ethics, Gesinnungsethik and Verantwortungsethik. The ethic of conviction, the ethic of responsibility. And put simply, the ethic of conviction is you act in accordance with whatever your conviction happens to be, regardless of the outcomes. And the ethic of responsibility is that you take responsibility for the consequences of your actions, including the unintended consequences of your actions. He felt especially that the ethic of responsibility is something that a politician needed to, uh, to cultivate. Now, Weber, Weber says that earlier on in his lecture, but as he goes on, it seems clear that he kind of wants a politician to combine these, these two ethics. Um, and there's some other conceptual problems with them. One of the points that Aron brings up is that uh, both ethics assume that, that uh, you can either calculate or not calculate the consequences of the action, but what that means is that they assume that you would have time to reflect on your action. Uh, and so Aron says there might be another dichotomy that we should take into account in analyzing political action, which is reflected decision versus immediate action. And in our increasingly sort of, you know, short-term view of, of the world and just how fast decisions need to be made and how fast uh, information flows in this day and age, uh, that might also be a useful uh, dichotomy. So yes, for, for, uh, um, for Weber though, the statesman combines both ethics. And what Weber has to say about this combination, he says it's a stirring sight when a politically mature man who feels with his whole soul the responsibility he bears for the real consequences of his actions and who acts on the basis of an ethics of responsibility says at some point, here I stand, I can do no other. That phrase that was commonly attributed to Martin Luther, here stage, he kann nicht anders. So that's the kind of statesman that Weber wants. What ends, though, should a politician seek out? I mean, Weber has a decidedly convictual view of, of the world. Um, Weber, you know, sees Germany as being a Machstadt because it has 70 million people. And what does he say? He says, the demands placed on a people organized as a Machstadt are inescapable. Future generations, and particularly our own successors, would not hold the Danes, the Swiss, the Dutch or the Norwegians responsible if world power, which in the last analysis means the power to determine the character of culture in the future, were to be shared out without a struggle between the regulations of Russian officials on the one hand and the conventions of English-speaking society on the other, with perhaps a dash of Latin raison thrown in. They would hold us responsible. And rightly so, for we are a Machstadt and can therefore, in contrast to those small nations, throw our weight into the balance on this historical issue. That is why we and not they have the accursed duty and obligation to history and to the future to resist the inundation of the entire world by those two powers. There's no compromise. This is Weber's War of the Gods. You know? Now, one of the problems there with the idea of no compromise and the War of the Gods, well, partly because as we, we you know, identified in the section on constitutional pluralist regimes, you, you kind of do need to have a sense of compromise if you're going to be involved in politics. I mean, it's kind of like Weber sort of seems to have imported his scientific, philosophical ethic into politics, but the statesman and the scientist are not the same. They operate according to different ethics. With the scientist, yeah, of course, with the scientist, I guess, you, you don't want to compromise. You don't want to compromise your devotion to truth. You want to find out what the truth is. You're not going to go for half truth. Whereas with a politician, oftentimes you might have to opt for uh, a half truth. So Weber speaks, but when Weber speaks of the ethic of conviction, he sort of speaks as if once your ethic's been chosen, then you have to stick to it just because. It's sort of an existential choice. 
He doesn't say much about on what basis your, your convictions uh, should be founded. He just says, you know, once you've chosen it, you stick to it. The problem, though, is that it at times also seems that Weber speaks as if choosing reason itself, were, or, or in science, were nothing other than an existential choice. But his own theory, his own ethic of responsibility, uh, would seem to require that one gives preference to rational thinking. So with Weber, there's a plurality of human ends, but they're always incompatible. For our own, our own doesn't necessarily think so. He doesn't necessarily think that the ends that we choose are incompatible. Maybe some of them are, but maybe some of them are compatible. Part of the reason for this is because our own doesn't think that once you choose your ethic, once you choose your conviction, what it is that you want to attain, that you have to stick to that for, for all time. We are, as human beings, open to reason and persuasion. You know, in fact, that's the very stuff of a constitutional pluralist regime, where we want to see a peaceful transition of power. We want to convince our interlocutors of our views. We want to change their convictions, not through force of arms, but through force of words. And these are ongoing processes, reason and persuasion. And so in the realm of science, the tragedy of Weber's philosophy is that he undermines his own dedication to science by assuming that science is nothing other than an existential choice. In the realm of politics, the tragedy of Weber's philosophy is that he expected that increasing Germany's power would foster German culture and grandeur. But because he defines power exclusively in terms of force of arms, he never thought that the naked pursuit of power could destroy the culture that he desperately wished to defend. And it's triply tragic in the sense that Weber understood this uh, better than, than anybody else. What is tragic? Tragic, once again, is the necessity to make certain decisions whose short-term risks are clear without being able to discern clearly whether one will achieve the desired outcome. But this is the essence of politics, and it was Max Weber, more than anyone else, who showed that for the actor, politics is defined by wages on the future, and that it appears to the historian like a series of intentions betrayed by events. Our own uh, used to comment on the former French president, Giscard d'Estaing, and said that uh, this man does not understand that history is tragic. He spends, he has spent more of his time reading John Maynard Keynes than reading Thucydides. Why should one read Thucydides instead of John Maynard Keynes? Why should one read the Hayek, for that matter, instead of John Maynard Keynes? What should we do in the light of tragedy? Our own has one of the things that he says, one of the more philosophical things he says on this note, is what is often referred to in the literature as his morality of prudence. And in the context of international relations, here's what he has to say about the morality of prudence. Prudence, which Edmund Burke called the god of this lower world. The first duty, political but also moral, is to see international relations for what they are, so that each state, legitimately preoccupied with its own interests, will not be entirely blind to the interests of others. In this uncertain battle, in which the qualifications of the participants are not equivalent, but in which it is rare that one of them has done absolutely no wrong, the best conduct, the best with regard to the values which the idealist himself wishes to achieve, is that dictated by prudence. To be prudent is to act in accordance with the particular situation and the concrete data, and not in accordance with some system or out of passive obedience to a norm or pseudo-norm. It is to prefer the limitation of violence to the punishment of the presumably guilty party or to a so-called absolute justice. It is to establish concrete, accessible objectives conforming to the secular law of international relations and not to limitless and perhaps meaningless objectives such as a world safe for democracy or a world from which power politics will have disappeared. Prudence exists between dogmatism and relativism. Prudence, because prudence presupposes that you're acting in the service of the good. If someone is, is very prudently uh, acting in the service of evil, it's not prudence, it's cunning at least by Aristotle's definition. Prudence presupposes acting towards the good. It presupposes uh, truth. 
But these things don't exist in relativism. In relativism, people either don't care about what's true or good, or they say that we just can't decide, you know, so just do whatever. Dogmatism, on the other hand, so in other words, the totalitarianism of the mind means that you're unwilling to hear challenges. You're closed to reason. You already, you already believe reason's on your side. So you're unwilling to compromise. You already have the truth. You already know what the good is. You don't need to talk about it anymore. Prudence is between these two extremes. At the root of politics lie values and reason. In other words, philosophy. Conflicting philosophies, which are not entirely closed off to each other, in which we can, we, we can, we can communicate between philosophies. We can try and convince interlocutors. So the root of politics lies philosophy, which we employ to interrogate and communicate our values. And these are threatened by totalitarianism, relativism, positivism, in, in other words, by any sort of dogmatism. So in this sense, politics depends, the possibility of politics depends on philosophy. And yet, at the same time, it was the ancient Greeks who were the first to observe that philosophy also needed to be protected by the political regime. The political regime enables philosophy. In, in this sense, philosophy depends on politics. And to go one further, philosophy, our ideas, our political regime, are all partially influenced by history and what we make of history. And so having gone from looking at the texture of history through an analysis of modern society and what the statesman should do, passing through tragedy and prudence, we return once again to history. Our own used to like paraphrasing uh, a phrase from Karl Marx, actually. He used to always say, men make their history, but they know not the history that they make. Thank you very much for your attention.